Hey everybody, good afternoon. Jason here with AV Pro Global Holdings and today we've got a really cool webinar uh, that we're going to be doing all about building a modern 4K home theater system. This is really going to be for the folks who are doing dedicated theaters uh, or maybe they're doing theaters in, in a living room. We see lots of that out there. Uh, but specifically how to kind of maximize the video, how to maximize the audio, and just some tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years to, to make these things perform their best. It's not all about how expensive your gear is and how much money you spend on the on the boxes and on the TV and whatnot. Uh, this is more about tips that will give you uh, great ideas on, on how to maximize uh, some systems that, that you may already have, have installed or, or maybe you're designing now. Um, I've got a couple of cool slides on uh, some rooms that I've worked on personally where the budget uh, – it was a budget conscious system, but the room was really good and, and everything turned out great. So uh, as we go through the presentation here today, uh, I've got a few slides that I'll show you, but I've also got a couple of special guests as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of home theater and, and what, what got us to here. Uh, and then we have another guest, uh, Anthony Gramani, who's an audio expert. He's a legend in our field. Uh, he's he's hold, held several uh, great jobs at some big audio companies. And I think uh, giving you guys some of his perspective on the thousand plus theaters that he's built over the years, I think will be really cool. Uh, Tom Devine, our marketing director, he is watching the question box. So if you guys have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type those in. I will give you guys just a little bit of a warning. Uh, our morning session uh, went great this morning. It did go over by about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so if you do have to jump off after that hour mark, that's totally fine. We are gonna record the session and, and get it posted to the social medias and the YouTubes and whatnot uh, later tonight or tomorrow perhaps. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to type those into the question box. Tom will um, divert a lot of the questions to to, to me and Anthony and, and John today, uh, but he'll do his best to answer any questions that you might have that uh, he has a good answer for you. Uh, if not, we'll leave some time at the end, no big deal, and uh, we'll, we'll do some questions at the end as well. So if you guys are new to AV Pro, uh, welcome. Uh, we are a, a homegrown company that specializes in HDMI connectivity and HDMI testing. We come from a background uh, very deeply involved with the Imaging Science Foundation and uh, we're really a company that cares a lot about picture quality. So as, as you look at some of our products, you know, we do everything we can uh, when we build matrix switches and extenders and things like that uh, to, to preserve the picture quality, to preserve the signal as, as best as we possibly can. Uh, the company was established in 2011. We really got our start in, in Meridio, our HDMI test equipment, doing some calibration work. Uh, we started noticing uh, in, in the early days that there was a lot of gaps in the market when it came to 18 gig products, uh, which was really the reason why we built the first uh, 18 gig signal generator. Uh, about two years after that, we said, well, wow, there's not any 18 gig matrix switches. So we went ahead and started building those. And, you know, having a deep understanding of HDMI uh, when it comes to testing is uh, translates really well when it comes to uh, distributing those signals. So we've got a really great handle on HDMI. Uh, our CTO, Matt Murray, uh, he's very, very heavily involved with the HDMI.org forum, uh, HDMI forum people. And uh, we do a lot of work with those guys. We do a lot of work with HD Base T. Uh, Jeff Murray, our CEO, he's been in the electronics industry for over 30 years. He worked for a big company called Sencore back in the day you guys might be familiar with. Uh, and, and really, uh, as a company, our goal is to make products for the integrators that are easy to use uh, and, and easy to troubleshoot. And uh, we try to make things as simple as possible, but also uh, keeping in mind high performance and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, we have some great engineers, probably some of the best in the business. We have great tech support. We've had nothing but compliments over the years on our tech support team. Uh, we've got a, a great staff uh, on our sales team that, that can answer any question for you anytime. So I'll give you some, um, uh, I'll give you some uh, resources at the end of the presentation today on how to get a hold of us if, if you do have any questions or we can help you in any way design, design a system or, or troubleshoot a system. Um, again, my name is Jason Dustel. I just celebrated my uh, three-year anniversary with the company, actually about three and a half now. I was actually a customer turned employee. Uh, I've been calibrating for a very long time, and, and uh, they approached me many years ago with the Meridio generator. <clears throat> and uh, again, at the time, it was the first ever 18 gig 4K HDR generator. So I did some testing on it for them. I just love what the guys were doing, what their vision was, what the company was all about. Uh, so I joined them about three and a half years ago, and things have been great ever since. Uh, I do teach classes all over the country. Uh, we do an AV Pro Academy class. It's two days, lots of hands-on, lots of uh, educational uh, hands-on activities there. Talk about terminating fiber and uh, you know setting up switches and those types of things, troubleshooting HDMI. Uh, feel free to visit our website, avpro.training, to see uh, dates and times on uh, on some of those training sessions. We are kind of on a hold right now, as you can imagine, but we do have our schedule worked out at, at least May on for now. So if you want to take a look at some of those classes, feel free. We also, uh, we also give uh, a lot of support to the Imaging Science Foundation classes, where we do three days of, of just display calibration. 
also the professional video alliance we helped uh we helped greg out a lot with the with those classes he's another three-day class about video calibration and then uh the home acoustic alliance we we have a hand in that class as well so uh, when it comes to calibration and troubleshooting and distribution and all the great things that we'll talk about today uh, just know the av pro we've got your back and uh, you can call us anytime with any any questions so our special guest today i kind of mentioned before anthony gramani he's a, again a legend in our field uh, he's been doing this for over 35 years, uh, heavy background in uh, electrical engineering, audio engineering, and acoustics. Uh, he's held some really, uh, really cool jobs that I can only dream of. I, I bet the, uh, his experiences with uh, Dolby and THX must have been awesome. But he's got a lot of acclimates to his name. He's, he's got a, a big name in our industry, so I'm really happy to have him on today's webinar uh, to kind of get his perspective and his, um, some of his thoughts about, about some of the stuff we'll talk about today. Uh, he does head up a couple of companies of his own now, uh, Gramani Systems which I believe is speaker design and speaker construction. We'll, we'll uh, have Anthony give you guys the, the skinny on that a little bit later. Uh, PMI engineering and dimension four. I know he does a lot of stuff when it comes to acoustic treatments and acoustic panels and all those types of things. So we'll get his, uh, we'll pick his brain in a little bit here. Uh, we also have John Tumbleson. He's actually a coworker of mine. Uh, if you've called tech support before or had, uh, had John help you program a system before, you might recognize the name. Uh, great guy. He's uh, been in the industry for about 40 years. So uh, we'll talk a little bit with John about sort of the history of uh, home theater and, and uh, kind of uh, reminisce a little bit, have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, so just some of the things we'll cover today real quickly. Uh, as I mentioned before, we'll talk to John here in a minute about the short history of, uh, a brief history of home theater at least. You know, these topics, guys, each one of these topics could go for an hour. So uh, we're gonna try to squeeze in as much useful information here as we possibly can. So we'll talk, talk about that a little bit. I'll touch on the room uh, as being actually part of the system. The room is a component. Uh, so we'll talk about that quite a bit, how important the room is. Uh, some questions you should ask your clients to determine uh, what kind of theater you build for them, how big, how big the screen is, how many seats, those types of things. So I got a couple tips for you there. We'll talk about infrastructure as far as how you're going to wire the system, uh, the backbone of the system, uh, you know, switches that you might use, extenders you might use, uh, or just straight HDMI. We've, we've definitely got options for you there as well. We'll talk a little bit about choosing the right display for the room. Uh, this topic has been covered tons and tons over the years, so we'll just kind of touch on it lightly. Uh, again, something we could talk about for hours, but we'll, we'll cover the high level basics for you guys. Uh, talk a little bit about screen size versus viewing distance. This is a hot topic right now, especially with high resolution, 4K and 8K coming. Uh, people are sitting closer and closer, screens are getting bigger and bigger, but there is a, there is a ratio, uh, sort of a ratio that you work with uh, to make sure that the picture is big, but also not full of um, artifacts and distortion. And, and what we really want to avoid is sitting too close, close enough that we can see pixels. So we've got some numbers, numbers there for you guys. Talk a little about audio layouts. Uh, I know, uh, Anthony's got some great slides on different uh, layouts and configurations for your audio and your speaker setup. We'll talk about the whys of audio and video calibration, why it's important. Uh, I've got a couple cool, uh, cool little tips for you there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, last but not least, how you're going to control the system. And I think we'll get John's perspective on that a little bit since he's been in the programming world for many, many, many years. And then we'll kind of just talk at the end very casually about uh, what the future holds for home theater. So that's just what we're going to cover today. So with that being said, um, John Tumbleson, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Cool. Yeah. Do you want to try the webcam this time or do you want to just go I'll, audio only? I'll, I'll give it a, a try, see what happens. Sure. Um, I restarted my computer so it may actually work this time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let's uh, uh, give it a minute and for success. Yeah, there we go. Ah, can there you, he is. How you doing, John? Okay. <laughs> cool. cool, cool. It's nice probably to see better you, just to look at the picture you had on the slide, but yeah, 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 right, yeah, we'll yeah, go okay. with it anyway. <laughs> no, I hear <laughs> it. So um, I wanted to just kind of just chit chat with you a little bit about the history. I know you lived through a lot of this stuff. Uh, just like you, I, uh, I'm i a huge enthusiast when it comes to home theater and audio and, and, and AV in general. So, um, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I kind of came in as a little kid, just twisting knobs on my grandparents' TV, like in the you know early to mid 80s. But I know there was a lot of history that had to lead up to that. Uh, you know, my grandparents at the time had a laser disc player, which I thought was really cool. But and I know you had a couple of things that you wanted to look at as well. So um, yeah, so uh, yeah, go ahead. Where do you wanna Where do you wanna start? Well, let's let's just go through kind of what I, I like to call the genesis of home theater. Like, where sure. Where did it really begin? There's lots of different theories out there and lots of different perspectives out there as to how and when it started um, and I you know was always I was in the in the 70s I was heavily involved in in audio and in fact I had my own private label speaker company at one point 
And I also installed discos at the time back in the 70s when when the disco thing was the rage. Oh, uh, so I got I got hooked on high end audio equipment, you know, and I had to have a pair of JBL 4333 studio monitors oh, in yeah. my living room, uh, you know, just to, just to listen to, to, you know, music, whatever it might be. Yeah. OK. And that got me to the point where, you know, I, I, I could record something. For example, back in in the uh, in the the late seventies, early eighties, there was a, a, a service in the Los Angeles area called On TV. For those that maybe maybe have heard about it before, On TV was simply a box that had a switch on the front of it, a knob, and you could either turn it on or turn it off. It it routed through uh, through your antenna connection, and in, and so what you would do is you'd set your TV at the time the channel three. This is the analog days on my my big giant 27 inch cathode ray tube. We, we used to do that with the Nintendo. You had to put it on channel three or four with your little RF exactly. switch. Yeah, same, yeah, yeah. The same idea. Then you'd flip the knob on that said, you know, turn it on, and that that now gave us programming from this service. Now the service basically had pre-scheduled uh, programming content, such as they would uh, have movies on Friday nights, or there'd be a concert, things of that effect. And so if we could go to the next slide, we'll just kind of get sure. into what I, you know, the, the, the kind of the challenge that we had. So here's a, a quick look at, these were the tools that were available to us in the late 70s and very early 80s, and then things changed. And they changed, that's where the genesis starts. But we'll just go over this. First of all, it, I, you know, it's, it's hard to find pictures these days, even yeah. on the internet, uh, uh, decent pictures, but basically I had, uh, you know, one of those little console TVs like the one on the left. That was, mm -hmm. you know, what everybody had in their home at the time. Uh, over on the, to the right of that is a, that was a 27 inch. On the right is is something that Sears made that basically had three uh, 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 cathode ray uh, uh, projection uh, type uh, bulbs. I don't know what else to call them. And they, 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 they uh, projected against a mirror that reflected up to that screen above. Now that is looks huge, but it was actually a 50-inch TV. Okay, so that was about as big as you could get back then. And um, and then over to the right, we we can see the Sony Betamax, which was the first VCR on the market as a consumer product. And basically, what I would do is when I would watch something on on TV, I would record it using the Betamax. Okay, and it would record the video fine. I mean, you know, beta was a little bit higher resolution than VHS, which was the competing product, but it wasn't VHS really didn't exist at the time. But the, the problem was is that the, the tape was moving through at a speed of, of about, uh, you know, uh, was it 1.8 1, 1. centimeters a second, which meant that the audio track itself was was really lousy because the the audio track was linearly set onto the tape and then something came out in 1983 called beta hi-fi and that changed the world this is this is the genesis of home theater was the ability to have high quality audio in a, in, a, in an audio tape so you could go down to the to the movie or video store and rent back then you rented tapes and <laughs> you brought them home there were no streaming or any of that kind of stuff, and you'd put it in there and you'd play it back. And and normally it would be the experience would be I'm watching TV, I'm watching a movie on TV, and that's about all there is to it. But what Beta Hi-Fi did is it turned it completely changed the paradigm where you had high quality sound. So what happens is your little 27-inch TV. The screen seems to grow, at least in your head. You know, mentally, it actually grows in size because the sound got bigger. Sure, that now makes sense. Now it had full, yeah, totally. full fidelity sound, which was, you know, and so it was like suddenly you had good bass. You know, if there was an right. explosion, it went off. There wasn't any more hiss. And the, 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 the difference in the design was that the audio tracks were actually embedded next to uh, or recorded right next to the video tracks which is in uh, and and what would happen is is that you had this spinning head that spun at 1800 rpms so that meant that your your audio track was now being recorded or playing back at 10 centimeters a second instead of 1.8 
So, you know, you, you had, you know, five, six times faster speed. The faster it went, the, the better the sound. I mean, and also, I mean, yeah, go ahead, oh, Jason. I'm sorry. I, I just kind of thought about this. It also seems like, I could be way off on this, maybe you know, but it almost seems like by doing the audio next to the video rather than under it, you might have more bandwidth or more surface area on the tape to lay down the audio. Is that, am I onto something there? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Because yeah, you didn't have to, to uh, yes. Uh, that way you could have more, you could have multi-tracks. So it would, could be stereo because I mean, when you when you recorded the video or the, or the audio on, on a linear fashion, uh, it was monaural. I mean, there just wasn't enough room to have a stereo right. track and nor was there a need. I mean, it sounded like hell. I mean, yeah. I remember having a graphic equalizer that I would use to to try to turn down the hiss and try to oh, turn man. up the you know the, just to try to fix the sound and it was just impossible. One mm -hmm. of the things with on TV is that when they had like let's say Star Trek the motion picture came out in the eighties, right? You know, and and we were able to watch it on on TV. They also had an agreement with a local FM radio station that would uh, allow you to to uh, tune to a certain frequency and have the soundtrack of the movie on mm -hmm. on FM and also have the TV video on the TV okay you and so now. and yeah well what would happen is they were synced of course during the initial playback but I would record on my reel to reel tape recorder oh nice the audio track off the FM feed and then record obviously the movie on video and then the real trick was syncing it after that you know, right. when, it, when, you, when you wanted to play it back. So basically going back to the slide, what happened with Beta Hi-Fi is, is that it opened up a whole new world of, of, of sound. And uh, if we go uh, to uh, the next slide, uh, I think it's gonna be a picture of what you're basically, this was the very first home theater, really for sure. all intents. And uh, and that's where it really started. So it's, it's this is long before Laserdisc came out, long before DVD came out. Mm -hmm. This is how you did it. And and unless you happen to be a movie mogul and you had your own giant mansion with your own right. 35 millimeter projector and all that good stuff. And um, so, yeah, go ahead. I, I remember as a kid, um, I would always get real excited about the connections on the back of a TV or something. You know, you peek your head back there as a little kid and you just see like a connection for an antenna not very exciting, but you peek your head back there and you've got a bunch of connections and different video types, and different audio types. And I just remember like my world changed when I discovered the uh, line out, you know, on a TV. So mm -hmm. everything I was watching through the TV, I could hook that up to a stereo now. And, you know, I could watch regular TV shows, but with nice big giant speakers at my, at my dad's house as a kid. So that was mm -hmm. a big game changer for me. Um, as much as I love video and I'm into video and I, I understand video, I'm really a, an audio guy at heart. So, uh, you know, being able to uh, watch in those days, especially watch MTV and stuff on the big speakers and listen to them on the big speakers was super cool. Yeah, that was cool. And and there was a kind of a breakthrough even on the broadcast side when they started to, including uh, high fidelity audio tracks called MTS. Mm -hmm. uh, before, prior to MTS, you had to, still had the same kind of crappy TV sound, but but with, with when once they started uh, broadcasting with MTS, then the, 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 even that, that got better. So yeah. you, know, you could watch your variety shows or whatever it might be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, the uh, the old in concert series on ABC. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, all those kind of things, they sounded great now. You yeah. Know? So yeah, it was it was fun. So this was a fun time. This is where I got bit by the home theater bug. Right. And and from there, it just I went crazy, you know, yeah. and I've been, I, I know always been into it. You know, I mean, <laughs> this was kind of a hobby for me. Um, and you know, one of the things that's great about working for AB Pro is I was able to take this love that I have for doing this stuff and actually work for it too, sure. you know, yeah. and, and work with it. And, yeah, uh, and it's, it's fun. So anyway, awesome, that's, that's the brief history. Thanks, man. Uh, I, I am noticing too, and you, you'll probably giggle at this, uh, back in the seventies and maybe early eighties a little bit, so much wood grain, like did every manufacturer just, everything was wood grain back then. It seems like. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you know, you look at that console TV, how beautiful that was, piece of furniture it was. Yeah. And that was, you know, it was a lot of them, that was like the center of your home, and, and you wanted it to look good with the rest of your stuff. I mean, even yeah. that, that, that that receiver up there, that's an old Fisher receiver. Yeah. It, it has a nice wood casing going around the outside of it, you know, just everything yeah. was wood.
for sure. I wonder what, I wonder what this TV weighed. Could you imagine? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah <laughs> a lot? It was pretty heavy. Yeah, a lot of yeah. glass in it. Tons of glass, yeah. 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 Cool, John. Well, yeah, stick around and uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll catch back up with you in, in a little while when we get towards the end and, and talk a little bit about the, the future. But if you, uh, you know, if you have any thoughts or something while I'm going here, uh, feel free to chime in, okay? Okay, we will do. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, and go ahead and uh, kill your camera too, that way. Okay. Uh, okay, there perfect. All right, All right, great. Uh, so you can still see my screen. Is that good? Yes, I can see okay. you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the next thing we'll talk about is, uh, we'll touch on a little bit, is the most important component in the room. Uh, it, to the average person, if you ask them what's the most important component in a the home theater system, you know, you'll, you'll hear people say, oh, the TV or the speakers or, um, and honestly, guys, the performance of that system really relies on the room itself. And I'll touch a lot on the video, of course, uh, and we've got a couple of tips here. And we'll talk to Anthony uh, towards the end here about some things that he might share when it comes to like, uh, acoustics and treatments and things like that but if we're talking video at least uh, so many things can make an effect on the picture room lighting number one uh, the darker you can make the room uh, the better off you are uh, at, at the end of the day as human beings our eyes are most sensitive to contrast so if I'm watching a bright picture in a bright room not a lot of contrast there if I'm watching a bright picture in a dark room tons of contrast uh, plus there's nothing really distracting you um, you know your peripheral vision nothing's uh, Nothing is distracting you from the picture. So when you're designing a, a theater system for somebody, or de especially a dedicated theater room, uh, you know, have a very, very serious conversation about room lighting and, and things like that. Now, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, in a perfect situation, we would be doing a dedicated theater room with 100% light control. So even if it is, you know, 12 o'clock uh, on a Sunday afternoon in, in Florida on, uh, during summer, where it's normally nice and bright out, uh, you know, somebody can go in and watch a movie and, and turn off all the lights and, and get that nice kind of uh, commercial theater experience. So everything down to windows, uh, the, the types of lights you use and all those things, uh, all those things really matter. Uh, the color of the walls matters. Um, if you think about, you know, let's say, uh, just imagine in your head, a dedicated theater room with yellow walls and the person is watching hockey or planet earth or something with a lot of white on the screen. Well, that white is going to bounce off the screen onto the walls and then back onto the screen. So now your image is polluted because of the, the color of the walls around you. So I've got a couple of tips here on, um, on, on colors and I've got some pictures of some theaters I've worked on uh, and give you a good idea of how this all works. Uh, the type of paint that you use, uh, you know, semi-gloss versus glossy versus satin versus matte, that makes a difference. Uh, you could do a nice dark gray or even a black wall, but if it's a glossy finish, it's gonna cause more reflection. So uh, all of this stuff matters. The, the ceiling, don't forget the ceiling. You know, we get a lot of um, reflections off of white ceilings all the time. Uh, the floor itself, uh, lighter colored carpet, or somebody likes to do bright red carpet. I've seen that before. All of these things will matter. And I've got again, I've got some pictures of some of some uh, really cool rooms I've worked on. Uh, seating distance and position. We've definitely got some recommendations for you there. Uh, a lot of this is going to be preference, um, and there's a there's a really easy way to find that out with the with the customer. And then of course the calibration. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Just uh, some basics on video calibration and, and why that's all important. But I do want to show you a couple of rooms. Uh, the room on the left that we're looking at. Uh, this was down in South Florida. This was probably a, a mid-budget type of room. Um, 2,500 or 3,000 lumen projector, uh, very common manufacturer, mass produced, good price. Uh, decent screen, not too big, uh, not too small. It was actually very, very good for the room. Um, the, uh, the, the big thing about this room that I really loved was that the, the uh, client, the customer did not spend tons and tons of money on the gear. He, again, because you don't always have to. If you have a really well-designed, really good room, um, you know, that, that'll that uh, that'll combat some of the shortcomings with, um, with inexpensive uh, pieces of gear. So what I really liked about this room in particular, the wall behind the screen was black. So there was no light reflecting anywhere in that matter. The walls next to the screen were also black. So as I mentioned before, if these walls were white, this green light is gonna bounce off the wall and then back onto the screen and eventually your eyes. So again, that this eliminates any pollution from the wall color. Again, the ceilings were black and the carpet was a little lighter, but it was dark in general. Uh, they even went as far on this uh, job to paint the, um, the, the, the trim down here, like a very, very dark gray. The furniture was also really dark. This was a really cool room. Um, you know, if they didn't want to turn some lights on because people were over and hanging out, that was okay. If you really wanted to go crazy dark, you could. Uh, so so this, this is more, what I would compare to what you'd experience at the movie theater. I mean, when you go to the movie theater, uh, what happens to the lights? The, the lights dim, of course, there's no windows and stuff like that. So again, to get maximum contrast and maximum color saturation, 
you know, it's really, really important to consider these types of things. Uh, the room on the right, uh, this was more uh, more of like a, what I would consider a high-end room with some really great equipment. Uh, what I wanted to point out here, uh, the carpet in here was actually like almost black. It was a very, very, very dark gray. Uh, and you can see the speakers here, these drivers were, were like an aluminum or like a silver kind of color. But the thing that stands out to me in this picture, the, uh, the lighting in this room was uh, very, very, very warm. In fact, it was almost orange. And you can really see that reflecting off of the uh, aluminum speakers and off of some of the components down here. Uh, it's even turning the black carpet kind of a, a dark orange color. You can also see it here on the furniture, making that black leather kind of orange. So uh, what ends up happening is, again, that orange light bounces around the room and eventually hits the screen. So what you end up with are some of these uh, orange uh, orange colors that are not supposed to be on the screen. That's literally from the lights. Now, the good news is here, guys, is that when it was movie time, you know, this customer took out a, rem a remote or an iPad, they push a button, all the lights would dim, and now we're back to a nice dark room. So uh, I just want to give you a, a, a little idea here of, of how the room lighting is so, so important. The one on the left, this was kind of an extreme example, and I really loved this room. Uh, it was designed really well. The paint was really cool. Uh, it had this whole Venetian sort of uh, old Italy kind of look to it. Uh, the walls were like a like a tan kind of almost yellow color uh, to, to sort of match the decor, to match the theme. Uh, but he also went with really, really, really orange, very, very warm lights as well. So you can see the same effect here. All this white, I believe this was like a Planet Earth or Blue Planet 2 maybe, but we're looking at a scene uh, in, in Antarctica or something. Actually, this might be the Art of Flight, but um, so we've got all this snow in the picture. All this stuff is supposed to be white, and you've got all this orange light bouncing off the screen and then eventually back to your eyes. So you can see uh, very clearly here how much the room lighting, uh, the color of the lighting, the color of the walls, this all makes a difference. And again, this is another situation like on the previous slide where when it was movie time, you're able to kill all the lights and and, um, and everything looked great. But again, you can get around some of these things uh, with uh, with the right with the right tools. Uh, the room, This room on the right, I really enjoyed working on this room. Um, they went with a little bit of a lighter uh, paint color. It's still... A, kind of on the darker side of gray, not quite black. Uh, this particular client didn't want to have like a, a cave in his room. So, and, and I get that, but the good news is, is that we went with like a really uh, darker shade of gray. Uh, the uh, the only thing I would have probably done a little bit differently here is the the baseboard and the, and the wall plates. I probably would have maybe done those in a darker uh, rather than the white, but they're so far out of the way of the screen. It's really probably not an issue in this room. This room also had a black ceiling, which helped a lot with the contrast. Uh, and the, the neutral gray walls uh, made it to where um, you know any light that was bouncing off the walls was not really hurting the picture too much. It was hurting the black levels a little bit, but as far as like changing the color of the picture, that was really a non-issue because he was using white lights with a gray wall. So uh, just a few pictures to share with you guys and, and show you some of the successful uh, systems I've seen over the years at least. Again, neutral, darker, and um, you know, try to try to avoid as much as you can any of those really shiny finishes like a semi-gloss or a gloss. Uh, I typically will go with or recommend at least satin at the most, and matte really matte really is the the best way to do it. But you guys, if you've worked with matte paint before, you know that you know just by touching it, the oil on your fingers uh, can can kind of mess up the finish there. So a uh, good compromise can be made with satin. Um, there's a company out there called Munsell M U N S E L L, and they make these. Uh, actually, I'm not. Actually, now that I say that, I don't know if that's the name of the company, but the paint colors are Munsell Gray. So you'll have like Munsell Gray 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, I think is how they number it. And depending on the number, depends on whether, uh, or, or determines rather whether that's a black or dark gray or light gray or whatever. But if you check out those Munsell paints uh, for your next job, that might help with some of these issues. Good. Okay, so uh, there might be a question. Let me just take a second here to check the questions. Um, I have a new customer with existing equipment. Uh, they have a four x four matrix switch. Uh, they also have some extenders with either HDMI over coax, it looks like. Uh, the balance lock up a lot. Um, what else does he say here? They have to do a lot of power cycling. Uh, running cat six and fibers out of the question. So I'm leaning towards, uh, Craig, I, it's a long question with a long answer, a little bit more than we have time for today. Uh, I'll myself reach out to you, or I'll uh, I'll let one of the, the sales reps know to reach out to you, and, and we can kind of get you some help with that. But uh, could, thanks for the question. Either way, it's good. Uh, okay, so um, we talk about audio. We'll talk a little bit about this with Anthony a little bit later. But you know, one of the big things with audio is uh, room size. You know, the the whole point of a speaker is to move air. 
So, uh, you know, depending on the room size, that's going to help you determine how many speakers and the size of the speakers and, and other things as well. Uh, with audio, it gets a little different with the building materials because, um, you know, with video, if we want to get more contrast out of the system, we can just simply paint the room darker. And, and that's a big, uh, big help. With audio, it's not quite that simple. With audio, uh, they actually have uh, materials, like specific materials that are used for acoustics. So if you're building a dedicated theater room, uh, you can get this really cool, uh, high quality drywall type material. And you can build the room to be very, very, very quiet so the people outside of the room uh, can't hear what's going on. And that also helps with sound pressure levels, keeping all that audio and all that energy kind of concentrated in that room. You know, every time the walls flex or the walls wiggle, uh, you know, that's lost energy. So we want to keep those, uh, we want to keep that energy inside the room and we want to uh, sometimes absorb uh, sound waves. Sometimes we want to reflect sound waves. And, and again, Anthony's got some really great slides on that a little bit later. Uh, the type of furniture that you use, cloth versus leather, uh, that will make a difference in how the system sounds. Cloth tends to absorb or leather tends to reflect. Uh, so that can make a big difference too. Uh, seating position, of course, with audio, it's really important to be in that sweet spot. Uh, and, uh, and, and we'll talk a little about that a little bit more with, the, with Anthony with the reflections and whatnot and the acoustic treatments. Uh, again, the, there's different types of acoustic treatments that do different things. Uh, we'll look at those, uh, some of those slides with Anthony a little bit later. And then last but not least, of course, is calibration. Uh, calibrating audio is, uh, in, in a lot of ways, very, very similar to calibrating video. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, an AVR manufacturer is not going to know your room, not going to know your speaker configuration. So it's super important to get the best sound out of that system to, uh, to match the, the speakers and, and match the system to the room that it's in. So how are you going to know how to design the system? That's really the most important question. I mean, it's so easy uh, for, uh, for an integrator to get really excited. A customer says, hey, I want to do a theater. Integrator's like, great, we're going to do a 200-inch screen and we're going to do a you know 9.2.4 sound system and all these other things. But uh, what it really comes down to is what the customer wants and what they're, what they're, what they're envisioning. Uh, a couple of questions that I like to ask uh, that are super essential and will help you make these decisions. The first question I love to ask somebody who's into theater uh, or designing a theater is where do you like to sit when you go to the theater? Uh, some people like to sit way up front. Some people like to sit towards the middle. I'm kind of a middle to two thirds back kind of guy myself. Some people like to sit way back. Uh, that's going to help you determine their preferred field of view when it comes to watching the movie. Uh, you know, imagine somebody who likes to sit really close. They've got a really big screen and they're watching tennis. They're literally moving their heads back and forth to watch the ball. Whereas somebody that's sitting way back in the theater can see everything at once. This is more of a preference thing. So you've got to ask the customer what their what their uh, preferences are. Uh, what do you like to watch the most? That's going to help you determine uh, how to design the room, whether it's dark or bright or whatever. Uh, if the customer is into movies and TV shows and documentaries, uh, this might be somebody who's going to go for a darker room and something that's a little more cinematic and a little more like the commercial theater. But maybe you're doing a multimedia room. We see this a ton these days. You've got a, a, a projector, you've got a pool table, people like to come over and watch football and have snacks and drinks and things like that. That might be a brighter room with, with some more going on with different colors and, and things like that. So really trying to figure out the customer's lifestyle is really going to help you with these things. How are you going to receive the content? Uh, as you guys can see behind me, uh, I'm a big fan of physical media. I still haven't found um, I still haven't found any streaming service that comes close to to what physical media can do. We're getting close. I mean, we've got uh, uncompressed music streaming services now, uh, but we're not there yet until until that day. And I'm also kind of a collector nerd at heart, so um, you know I like these steel books and box sets and, and movies like and buying movies and things like that. How many seats? You know, maybe this is a big family, small family. Maybe it's a small family who likes to have company a lot. Uh, you know, there's a huge difference in budget and system design when you go from uh, a four seat or a six seat theater to a 10 or 15 seat theater. Uh, a lot of things have to be rethunk when, when you're going with that big of a theater. Screen size, the depth of the room, speaker layouts and all these types of things. So how many seats do you want? Room dimensions, of course, that's gonna be the number one thing, especially for the audio guys. Uh, they'll, they'll talk a lot about uh, filling the room up properly with, with speakers and with sound. And then of course, who's using the system? You know, we, we want the system to be easy to use uh, and all the AV Pro products that, that we offer as far as matrix switches and things like that. Uh, all of our stuff uh, works works with uh, all the major uh, control manufacturers and, and automation companies. So as far as the infrastructure, how are you going to wire the system? Uh, we're in a day and age today, guys, where bandwidth is really what's determining how we're going to lay our infrastructure out. Uh, with things going towards HDMI 2.1 starting last year and, and of course this year and, and, and into the future, uh, consider fiber going forward, guys. Uh, you know we do we do have some great bullet train HDMI cables that are just normal passive copper cables, uh, but eventually you're going to run out of bandwidth with those. 
so we do have a full line of uh, what we call AOC cables, active optical cables. There's actually fiber in here as well as copper. The audio and the video is transmitted over fiber, so we can go really long distances. We can go lots and lots of bandwidth. We do make these in 18 gig and 48 gig, and anywhere from half meter little jumpers all the way up to 100 meter really long ones. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are doing extenders and things like that. You know, when you when you do an extender, there's always uh, kind of that worry about compression and things like that. So going with uh, with fibers gets rid of all those conversations. And, uh, you know, especially if you have that real demanding video file, which is maybe they bought a really nice projector, uh, you're going to want to hardwire that uh, with HDMI as, as much as you can. Uh, just a quick sneak peek here at our 48 gig cables. This stuff is all on our websites. Uh, but of course, we we max these things out as much as we could. It supports every type of video format, every type of audio format. Um, you know, lots, lots going on here, but these cables are great. They come in these big spools, uh, again, up to 100 meters if you need to go that far. What a lot of other folks are doing right now is they're just laying straight fiber. So uh, we have a couple of HDMI, uh, I'm sorry, we have a couple of yeah, HDMI extenders that use fiber uh, versus the traditional Ethernet or category cable like what you see on the screen. So what a lot of folks are doing right now, if they're doing pre-wire or they're just trying to future-proof the system, they'll go ahead and lay this bare fiber uh, and maybe it's not being used right now, maybe it's dark for now, uh, but but eventually you will use it. So as far as pre-wiring and, and doing things like that, I'm a big fan of um, of uh, going ahead and laying this fiber down. And again, if you're not going to use it today, you will use it in a few years. So go ahead and do that and get it out of the way now. Um, category cable uh, is a great way to do your extension. But remember, you're going to be a lot more limited in this case when it comes to distances. Um, you know, you can only go so far with copper. Uh, it only carries so much bandwidth. So we have to do some tricky things with compression to make sure this picture still looks good. But going with fiber, if you look at the screen up here, like these fiber kits, uh, the fiber plugs straight into the transmitter, straight into the receiver. So what's connecting the receiver to the transmitter is now just a piece of bare uh, like OM3 fiber cable, like what you're seeing right here. So long, long, long distances, lots and lots of bandwidth. And that's really uh, that's really the best way to do it right now. But we do have other options as well. We do have our traditional copper based, uh, you know, HD based T extenders. We do have a full line of matrix switches that support HD based T. Um, our new matrix switch, the 16 by 16. We've got some output cards that are coming soon that will actually plug straight fiber in, which I'm really excited for. So regardless of what you guys are doing with the infrastructure and, and, and uh, whether you're doing a 4K system or doing a 4K system now, but hopefully in the future preparing it for 8K, uh, whatever you guys might be uh, interested in or if you have any questions, again, give us a call. We're happy to help you with any of this stuff. All right, now the different room types. This is gonna help you pick a display. Um, for a bright room with lots of ambient light, you're probably gonna go with an LCD. Uh, LCD panels can get very, very bright. Uh, they're super efficient. Uh, they come in really big sizes now. You know, if you're fighting a lot of room lighting, what I see here in Florida a lot, like in a lot of uh, summer homes and, and sunrooms and things like that, houses on the beach, condos downtown, uh, tons and tons of ambient light with no control. Uh, I'm going to typically recommend an LCD panel to them. Now, maybe they go a little above and beyond and they do add some light control and they do want, uh, they, they do love the, the idea of having those really deep black levels on an OLED you can get away with that uh, with a with a darker room. So if you have a normal room, what we consider a normal room, maybe uh, it's not bright, but it's not dark. Maybe there's some shades or, or blackout curtains over the windows. Uh, you can get away with a lot more with stuff like that. Um, you know, of course, there's gonna be those uh, conversations of viewing angles and things like that. The guys at OLED, as great as they are at a lot of things, uh, viewing angles being one of them, they're not perfect, but they are better than LCDs. So if you have a weird room, it's a weird shape or it's a re weird size or uh, somebody still uh, insists on putting the TV over the fireplace, uh, we might be in inclined to recommend maybe an OLED in that case uh, because of the viewing angles. But again, uh, based on the room and based on the design, you know, it's really easy to add curtains, right? But it's not easy to, to rebuild a room. So uh, a lot of times when you're giving the consultation or you're talking to the customer about how to get the most out of this room and the most out of the system, you know, don't be afraid to just make the suggestion of covering up some windows and, and turning off lights and things like that. Now, of course, a perfect scenario, we would have 100% light control. In that case, we can do whatever we want. We can go with a projector, uh, you know, uh, even with a bigger screen if we want to, if the room's nice and dark. Of course, OLED will work great in that situation. LCD would work great in that situation too. Uh, but LCD is a little more appropriate, almost a necessity when you go with a, a, maybe a bright room or a normal room. So just a few things there to think about uh, when picking a display. Uh, now, we talk about screen size versus uh, viewing distance. Uh, this is an important one. Uh, we've all sat too close to the TV before. I used to do it when I was a kid, uh, and I, uh, even sitting this far away from a laptop these days still might be a little bit too close. Uh, the point of failure that we consider the point of failure is when you're sitting so close that you can see pixels, 
you know you can see individual pixels you can see lots of artifacts and distortion and noise and things that you shouldn't see so backing away from the screen is going to be a big help for you in, in those types of instances and yes I, I i know nobody likes to hear this but yes it, you can have too big of a screen especially in a theater system where you've got a projector it's only going to put out so much light so lighting up a 200 inch screen versus a 100 inch screen uh, you know it takes a lot more power so it's almost like uh, you know putting a, a ls1 v8 engine into a miata right if you if you've got a big engine a big projector in a, in a smaller body or a smaller car aka a smaller screen uh, you'll be able to light it up like crazy so uh, you know we get we get clients all the time that want to go crazy and do 180 200 inch screens and that's fine but you've got to really consider the the how much light is in the room and, and the horsepower of the projector uh, you know you start seeing these high high lumen projectors nowadays 5,000 plus lumens and you know that that's where things can get really cool with with screen sizes. If we use something like uh, just my example here at home, uh, I'm about uh, this chart comes from Artings. Those guys are great. Feel free to download that chart from their from their website if you want to. But uh, lots of these charts exist out there. So if we take my situation at home, uh, at least in the bedroom, I've got a 65 inch TV. I'm about seven feet from it, so that puts me right about here. So in my case, 4K is good. Now, what if I wanted to sit closer or go with a bigger screen? You know, if I wanted to sit closer, I could still be as close as about four feet. Uh, and still not be able to see pixels. If I start getting any closer than that, uh, I'm going to start seeing some pixels and start seeing some some gross stuff uh, in the picture. So we want to stay away from that. Uh, of course, if you go bigger in size, you can sit closer in a lot of ways. But uh, with the higher resolution, you know, if you got a 100 inch screen, uh, you can still sit as close as six feet and, and get good um, good resolution and, and get good performance out of a 4K system. So uh, as we start looking in the future at like wall size TVs and things like that, uh, this will become very very important. In, in, we, we saw a 535 inch micro LED wall at the last uh, ISE show. So high resolution, sitting close, and those types of situations will be super important too. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the viewing angles uh, and, and field of view, if you will. Um, the typical field of view that most uh, most humans agree on is, is, is acceptable for watching movies is about 30, 33% or 33 degrees rather. Uh, so we kind of made this graph based off of a 10 foot wide screen. Uh, so as you can see, if you're the type of person who likes to sit really close, uh, maybe you're 10 feet away from a 10 inch, uh, or, sorry, from a 10 foot wide screen that puts you at a one to one ratio, but your field of view is about 53 degrees. So now you're back to that uh, kind of issue we talked about before, where you're watching a tennis match and you literally have to move your head back and forth uh, across the screen to see the ball. And some people like that, and that's okay. Uh, where we like to be is in this late yellow or early green. Uh, ratio right here so about 1.7 1.8 uh, uh, of the screen width with about a 30 33 degree viewing angle or, or, or uh, field of view rather this seems to be a great sweet spot for most people so again if you talk to your customer they like to sit up front maybe they like to sit in the middle maybe they like to sit towards the back uh, this is going to be a personal preference thing this is a handy chart you're welcome to it if, if you want to share it I can I can send it to you just send me a note and I'm happy to do that uh, this comes straight from the ISF presentation, uh, and it's all about contrast ratio. Uh, again, our eyes are most sensitive to contrast than anything. So uh, these are just some requirements that are uh, recognized by ANSI, and um, you know, for you guys out there who might do a lot of commercial work, these are in some cases requirements, especially if you're doing medical uh, medical displays or, or uh, military displays and, and, and environments like that. So uh, what we come up with with contrast ratios for just in, informational viewing, so a PowerPoint, for example. Uh, for that picture to be viewable and everybody to be able to see it in the room, we should be at least seven to one. That's not very much contrast. But if you're looking at PowerPoints, no big deal. We go from uh, there to basic decision making. So that could be like reading bar graphs or pie charts or things where it's not super critical, but you still have to make some decisions and you have to be able to tell the difference between certain shades and different colors and whatnot. We should be at least 15 to one. Critical decision making is up to about 50 to one. So this is when you're looking at things like specific colors, maybe you're a graphic designer making a new logo. Uh, at 50 to one, that's where things get really, really important. Now, going to motion video, now we're up to about 80 to one. Uh, that's where uh, that's where most people get the best experience, 80 to one or more. Uh, and 80 to one is, is not really hard to hit these days, but it's not easy either. If I've got a 2000 lumen projector and 180 inch screen and the room is bright, I'm not gonna ever be able to hit 80 to one. There's no way. So these should be some um, some minimums for you guys to kind of aim for when you're when you're designing a room. Of course, we talk about some LCD panels and some OLED panels that just they laugh at this 80 to one because they can do so much more. But for for motion video and a good experience, uh, we should be at least 80 to one. So keep that in mind. And the good thing about the contrast ratio measurements these days, 
It's all standardized. Uh, ANSI has uh, has the right test patterns for it. We teach it in the ISF classes and the AV Pro Academy classes. Um, so there's a there's a test pattern that's basically a black and white checkerboard. Uh, you take some measurements, you do a couple quick uh, calculations, and uh, you'll get your contrast ratio. So just keep that in mind, guys. 80 to 1 is a, is a good place to be. Um, I also like to recommend to people make sure the middle of the screen is eye level, at least the middle of the screen to about the bottom of the screen. Uh, the last thing you want is for your customer to be looking up all the time and uh, have a sore neck and those types of things. Uh, what I'm really excited to see these days are these mantle mounts for TVs. Uh, so you have a flat panel TV, maybe a big 77 inch OLED or something that actually pulls off the mantle and down so you can be eye level again. I love that type of stuff. Um, with speakers, uh, the, the speaker should be ear level as well. Uh, you, you'll see in a lot of professional theaters, the, the surround speakers and stuff are, are a bit lower than what most people would, would think is normal. I just, I go into so many homes where the, you know, the front two speakers are mounted way up in the corners and they're aimed out into the room and not down to the, towards a listening position. So just keep that in mind as you're designing the audio systems to try to keep those uh, speakers as ear level as you possibly can. And then with speaker layouts, we've got several different options there. Uh, 5.1 seems to be the minimum these days. 7.1 is a little more normal. And of course, we're starting to see a lot of uh, object-based audio as well. And we'll talk to Anthony about that here uh, in the next couple of minutes. So as far as the video goes, why should you calibrate it? Um, you know, the out-of-the-box settings on a projector or a TV, the manufacturers don't know, guys. They don't know how the room's going to be lit. They don't know what you're going to be watching. They don't know any of those things. So they just give us these generic presets. And it's even more important with a projector because they don't know what screen you're going to be lighting up. And with the potential to do a, a, a gain screen or an ambient light rejection screen or all these different types of screen materials out there, different screen colors even, uh, they don't know. So again, you've got these generic presets and uh, you know, a calibrator will come in and, and really match the video system to the room that it's in. And the benefits of that are real simple. These are good talking points if your customers aren't familiar with calibration. Uh, see all the details in the bright and dark parts of the picture. If I watch a dark movie, I should see all the shadows. Uh, skin tones. Skin tones should look realistic. I, I shouldn't turn on the news and have orange people. Uh, accuracy of the color. You know, if I'm watching, a, I, I know you guys are going to laugh at this, but we will have Tom Brady in a Bucks jersey uh, at some point uh, here pretty soon. So if I'm watching Tom Brady on TV in a Bucks jersey, I just want to make sure his jersey is correct. If I'm watching The Art of Flight or, or Planet Earth and they're showing an Antarctica episode, I want the snow to be white, not greenish white or bluish white, things like that. Uh, the clearest picture possible, you know, we can we can calibrate the system so that uh, the, the edge enhancements and all those things are turned off. And, and really, at the end of the day, it's to experience the content uh, the content as the creators intended. So if I sit down next to George Lucas, we're looking at one of his movies, and he goes, "Yep, that looks correct." Uh, that's the whole point of it is to get everybody on that same sort of playing field. So the calibration is going to maximize your details in the picture. It's going to maximize the video performance of that of that uh, of that system in that room. Just a couple of uh, cool screenshots here I grabbed. Uh, this is an example, three different manufacturers, three different uh, types of technologies. Uh, in fact, I th actually think two of these were um, LED, LCD, and one's an OLED. Um, if you guys can kind of guess there, uh, the middle one is the one that's calibrated. If you look at the one on the left, there's a, a little bit of extra blue in there. The one on the right has a lot of extra blue in there. So the whole point of this, guys, is to get, to get the proper color here. So when we do video calibration, um, you know, the, the reports at the end show you a really cool story here. So you can see on the pre-calibration report, uh, you know, we're aiming for these little targets right here. That lets us know that those colors are accurate. So before the TV was calibrated, you know, green was like way out here, oversaturated. It made grass look really funky. Uh, the white point was too blue, which causes these types of errors over here. And it's just all over the place. So the end goal for video calibration is to get this nice, accurate color gamut and to get a nice accurate grayscale that way when you watch a movie or tv show it actually looks correct so that's uh that's video calibration in in 30 seconds and just kind of a nutshell but um we've got lots of other webinars on our youtube page that go way deeper uh, i've actually got a, a calibration scheduled for thursday on a jvc projector that i'm going to um stream that live so if you guys want to see uh see me in action doing a projector calibration sign up for that webinar uh for this uh I believe it's this thursday so with the video portion being sort of covered uh, I do want to uh, introduce Anthony to the group and uh, talk a little bit about uh, why you should calibrate audio and talk a little bit about, you know, room treatments and just give you guys some of the basics. Uh, Anthony, can you hear me? And I can unmute your mic if you are having problems for some reason. I, I am oh, hearing you and you I have unmuted my mic and a Great. second here you're going to be able to see me. Hola, Perfect. everybody. And there's Anthony. How are you, my friend? I am doing excellent. Excellent. Good. Thank you. So um, I sort of came up with some bullet points um, just with my, you know, I, I, I took the Home Acoustic Alliance 
audio calibration course over a decade ago and uh, you know one of my biggest regrets with that is not practicing a lot so I've kind of I'm kind of out of the loop a little bit especially some of the some of the newer stuff but I just wanted to put some bullet points on the screen um, that that made sense to me on on why calibrating the, the audio is so important and you know if you have anything to add to this I'll share my screen again if you have anything to add to this you know feel free so you know in video we talk about seeing shadows in audio we talk about hearing subtle details is that fair to say sure sure that's a good way to put it yeah yeah and I know uh, the audio guys, you know, we're always talking about like imaging and sound staging and all these all these audio terms. Um, and really to the end user, when you're talking to them about the design of the audio system, like what does all this mean? What, what, what's what's in it for them? Uh, well, so if you break down the content of a, of a movie, of a movie soundtrack, uh, first and foremost, there's dialogue. OK, I know we all get excited by all the boom and crash and surround right. effects. The storyline is carried by mostly by the dialogue, although although there are scenes in movies where you can go a full 10 minutes with just music and sound effects and you can hear what's going on. There's a there's a few notable uh, movies. There's scenes in James Bond movies where they love to do that. But yeah. most of it's and the quality of dialogue can be affected a huge amount by frequency response errors in the room. Uh, to, uh, temporal errors in the room that come from reflections and echoes and you got to calibrate all that stuff so that the dialogue sounds clear and what I mean by clear is it is it should be as clear as a as an announcer on one of the television news shows or as a BBC announcer I go to a lot of rooms with some pretty nice gear uh, but because either the acoustics were not set up correctly or calibrated correctly or because the uh, the speakers were not set up correctly or tuned or equalized the dialogue sounds fuzzy and then you find yourself leaning forward you find yourself going eh, what did he say what did she say right. and that's not right so first and foremost is is a dialogue next i i suppose is the quality of bass um if you if you look at what people get excited about you know in the order of things it's clear that good tight uh, punchy properly uh leveled bass is really important and that can be really really hard to get right uh, the way bass interacts with the room as a resonant cavity that does this to the sound of a perfectly good speaker i, I hope you can hear the difference between oh, this yeah, totally yeah totally um so that my hands cupped around my mouth is the same thing as a room cupped around speakers and subwoofers that has to be tuned it has to be calibrated it has to be corrected um I've got tons and tons of slides that can show that. Actually, I'm yeah, going to yeah, feel free. Share your screen and, and let's take a look at some of your slides. I, this, these came from uh, these slides came from your CDA presentation, right? Right. So so uh, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of different things over here. To remind me what I need to do here. I need do I need to um, let on. me make you the presenter. Right. And then from there, you should be able to share your screen. Then I'm going to have to scramble to find the slide I want to put up. But yeah. Right, yeah, I think you had what three hundred slides on that one. <laughs> oh, I've got I got lots of stuff here. So slides on top of slides. To that, <clears throat> just to show you how bad the bass can get um, because of this thing called standing waves. You know, resonances in the room that cause the bass at certain places to be different. This is an actual test. Um, this is a test. Had you been? <laughs> you know, hold on a second. Show a little stuff. So this is. This is an actual test done in a room. Uh, this is a 16 by 13 by nine, so not particularly big or odd, weird room. And this um, is, Anthony, this is real world. This is like an actual customer's this is, home. This is, uh, in this case, uh, this is actually in one of our, uh, of our showrooms, one of our demo rooms at my office. Um, a very good triad subwoofer was put outside and measured in the near field. And here was its frequency response. Uh, so for those of you who, know what this chart means it just it just shows that the as you change frequencies the sound of the subwoofer barely changes from 20 hertz all the way up to let's say 300 hertz there's very virtually no change which means it's linear you take that very good subwoofer and you stick it in a location in the room that would be near the left speaker and you remeasure that uh, and here's an actual picture of that oh. measurement um, so this is a microphone at the seating location, there's that subwoofer where the left speaker would be. And here's the frequency response of that subwoofer. Oh, so what is, man. Um, so I don't know if you remember, much. originally the, the curve looked kind of like here and it was flat. And instead yeah. we have this oh. up and down thing that looks like you're uh, going uh, going through the, the teeth of a badly set up saw. But the errors 
are up to 38 decibels from Oof. here to here. Now, what does 38 decibels mean? That's actually a difference of, of 99%. Essentially, if you took this level and you turn down to 1% of what you had originally, you ended up with that level. So th does that, I, I think on the screen, that dip is right around like maybe 50, 52 hertz or so? Yep. yep. That seems so like a really, really bad place to have a dip. Uh, and I'm going to ask you why in a second, but first of all, the difference between 38 hertz and 52 hertz is 38 decibels, which means it's gone down 99% of where it was before. Oh, so man. that's so bad. You said it seems like a really bad frequency. Quiz for you, for y'all. Why is that so bad? Let's see if anybody, uh, guys, go, in, go into the question box and uh, feel free, interact. Um, let's see if anybody has that uh, has a good answer for that. Uh, somebody mentioned a, uh, a uh, Josh says it maybe causes a room node. Well, it is because of a standing wave, uh, but who cares? Should we care? Is this a problem? All right. Uh, so we should play some hold music. Do, do, do. <laughs> yeah. All right. So first of all, what, uh, I'm going to say that at, at, what we're looking for in good quality audio is errors of plus and minus three decibels so that there's no sounds that are louder than others by about three dB. Uh, which, which over the frequency balance of a speaker is acceptably good. Um, what we have here is 38 dB, which is horrible. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give it away. This frequency, 52 hertz, happens to be the typical main resonance of a kick drum in a rock in a rock kick drum, like a 22 inch diameter kick drum. If you set it up correctly, it's going to go boom at 52 hertz. In this particular room, you listen to rock and there's no kick drum. It's gone. All you hear is the tick of the mallet. Not good. Also happens to be the frequency where most of the grunt in an action scene, you know, the stuff that makes you uh, feel like, wow, the walls are coming down, there's a lot of explosions going on, that's right there. So that perfectly good subwoofer for you put in this room and it sounds puny. It sounds like you've got a transistor radio going. So not good, absolutely not good at all. So all of that has to be calibrated out. It, um, we'll, t uh, we'll talk later at some other point when we only have three minutes left, but um, let me turn that off. Can you see me now? Yep, you're back. I'm here in my tiki hut. Um, <laughs> there's a long story to that. <laughs> That's okay. I'm in my bedroom, so. <laughs> you're in your bedroom. Um, yeah. I got kicked out of the bedroom and over the tiki hut. Um, there you go. So uh, the calibration, one of the things is going to be to maybe move the subwoofer around to see if we can reduce those errors. And if we had more time, I'd show you what happens in this room as you move the subwoofer around. There's places where there's less errors. Mm. Um, and so we can go from 38 dB errors to only 20 dB, which is a whole lot better, still not great. The rest of it has to be tuned out with equalization with some acoustical materials, which I'll talk about right now. So all yeah. of that is calibrating. Um, maybe the best way to talk about calibration is the same way as you talked about video. You take a perfectly good video projector. The manufacturer does not know what environment you're going to put it in. And so you have to tune it. Same thing with audio. Perfectly good speakers put in a room are going to get screwed up by the room. That's just how it is. And calibration is what it's going to take to correct all those errors. Mm -hmm. Calibration is, of course, in level, in time delay to make sure that the arrival of all of the speakers to your head are all about the same, and in frequency response, which is also sometimes known as equalization. It's a technical term to mean that you're equalizing the errors, but really it's, it's calibrating the amplitude versus frequency response to make it be smooth. And so we're trying to get rid of this. And we're, we're, getting, we're finding where all the frequencies are pushed and pulled, and we're going to correct that. Now, sure. doing only equalization without trying to do something to the acoustics uh, can be challenging. Sometimes you can make it better, to be fair. Sometimes you can do enough with EQ. But if you really want a good result, you want to design the room correctly. You want to put the speakers in the right locations. You want to put some amount of acoustical material in the room, not too little, not too much. And then you want to tune, equalize, calibrate, and then um, actually in the wrong order, but maybe in, before that is you want to sit at locations in the room where the errors produ produced by the room are less, uh, less detrimental. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this business uh, of, uh, I'm going to need you to give me the presentation handles yes. again. This, and, this uh, business. Oh no, you should still have the uh, presenter. You should still be the presenter. Okay. Do you what? What do you see right now? Um, I see your PowerPoint and our faces. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to go back up to this business a little bit. I alluded to uh, of the of the the acoustical stuff. So uh, again, the the five point recipe for making this all good is 
first design a room that's good, two, choose the right speakers and put them in the right location, three, do some acoustical uh, control, four, put the seats at the right locations, and yeah. five, tune and equalize. I'm just going to show you a few slides from this, this three-hour presentation I just did at the ISC show in Amsterdam, which is a great show. If any of you can ever get out there, um, next year you'll be moving to Barcelona. But it's an yep. amazing show. But, um, so this, this was a, a course on acoustics. Um, don't really have time to get much into it, but I like to think of the acoustics of the room as, as the interface, as the final interface. After you've connected all of the electronics together and fed them to a speaker, the sound waves that go in the room are out of control and taking control of the acoustic interface is a good idea. Um, I'm going to bypass this and say that, hey, reflections can be distortions, uh, but did you know, did you know, did you know that at the main seat of a typical home cinema, 10, 12, 13, 14 feet away from the speaker, you actually listen to more reflected sounds than direct sound. Let me show you this. So this is a direct sound from the speaker to the listener. This is the room seen from above. And then these are reflected sounds off the side walls, off the back walls. Um, so this is just a few reflected sounds. But you can see that there's more blue arrows going to you than there is a uh, black arrow. In reality, there's also reflections from the ceiling and floor, reflections from the front wall, from the back wall. Um, so if you don't take control, and I, what I mean by take control is not eliminate, but actually control those reflections, you're going to end up with sound that's not so good. So um, what, you, what I mean by not so good is no matter what you're listening to, whether it's a symphonic orchestra playing in your room uh, or a, a movie soundtrack where you're inside the cockpit of a jet fighter, it's all going to sound like the room. Your, your ear brain system has the ability to detect that those sound reflections are a certain place and it doesn't matter that you try to put a concert hall in it it's always going to want to make your brain uh your conscious mind feel like oh yeah that's the size of the room not a big concert hall so we want to try to do something to eliminate that sound field limitation of the room and that's by by reducing and controlling the reflected energy with that you can actually believe that you're in a jet fighter you're out in space you're in a cave, you're in a concert hall, you're in a bedroom, you're in a hall, wh wherever. So, um, again, here's a room with no acoustical treatments. You'll hear some direct sound. Uh, you'll hear some reflections off the sidewall. Uh, this is a more developed uh, example with sounds bouncing around. The green arrow is what goes directly from the center speaker to your head. The red arrows are what's off axis from the speaker and bouncing around in the room. And that's just the right wall. This is the left that's just wall. One, that's just one wall, yeah. <laughs> wow. So all those red vectors uh, are a lot of reflections and chaos does rain. So um, if you look at it in the time domain and you thought, hey, let's, let's make an impulsive sound, leave the speaker and hit your head. An impulsive sound would be like a hand clap. And you looked at the first, uh, the, the first thing that hits your head, that's the direct sound. But then there may be some reflections off the side walls uh off the ceiling and floor clusters of reflections all of this is going to tell your mind this is the sign of sound of the room and through some good work in controlling the uh the reflection decay of the room you can end up with something that looks like this which is smoothed out which sounds a whole lot better so uh we're going to do that through a combination of some absorption materials and some scattering materials um and we're not going to do too much of it so if a little bit of salt makes a dish taste good what happens if you pour the whole can of salt in, in the dish oh no no good if a bit of absorption makes the room be good what happens with a lot of absorption it makes the room be bad and that's because yeah. if you look at all the reflections the human mind goes what i'm in a room where's all the reflections so the main thing is you want a good balance between uh the direct sound the reflections absorption scattering all of that needs to be done correctly now um there are volumes written on this stuff. Probably the best resource is a book by Floyd Toole called Sound Reproduction. It's a yep. big, thick book. If you got a long vacation or a really long lockdown time. <laughs> if, Gee, I uh, wonder. <laughs> <laughs> if this thing keeps going on internationally, you can maybe read that book, pick it up. Um, but what I wanted to conclude is it's with, a, with a really simple recipe for what you do with the acoustical treatment so the speakers can work better with the room. So what we want ultimately is to hear some direct sound 
we want to absorb some of it. We want to scatter some of it. We want to absorb some of the reflection. We want to scatter some of the other reflection. Absorb, scatter, absorb, scatter as you go around the room. So this is an ideal, it idealized layout of treatments in a room and what comes off these treatments. So um, this is a top view of a room with a 7.1 channel system. That's a right speaker, a center speaker, a left speaker. It's five minutes over. Can I keep going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good. We're good on time. Uh, most All Actually, right. almost everybody's stuck sticking with us here. So yeah, you're good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. So what I'm showing here is on the left wall, this curve shape means a, a hemi disc diffuser. That's a device that the sound that impinges on it is going to reflect back just as a, as a disc. This is an absorber. That's a diffuser, an absorber. This is a hemisphere diffuser. That's a device that when the sound hits it, it's going to re it hemispherically. It's an absorber, diffuser, absorber, diffuser. There's some diffusers on the ceiling, diffusers on the floor. If you do this kind of thing, you will end up with good sound. And what I mean by good sound is there's going to be a believable sense that the dialogue is clear, the music is believable, and your ability to be convinced that you're in a submarine, uh, in a concert hall. Sure. In a jazz, in a, in a, in a small jazz club in a basement in New York oh. after the lockdown is over um, any anywhere it's going to it's going to be believable now it, the, the result of it is that ultimately you're going to hear direct sound and you're going to be enveloped by a smooth crescent of of energy all the way around the room and there is going to be reflected energy but it's going to be smooth now yeah go ahead is is there a uh, is there a rhyme or reason or a method to the madness of um when you're setting up a room like what you just showed um where you have some absorbing materials and some reflecting materials how do you know uh, where to put what? Or is that just based yeah. off your testing with your microphone? So that might uh, be an hour long question, but. <laughs> there is a total rhyme and reason. So lots and lots and lots of work has been done on the perception on what's called small, in small room acoustics on the perception of the sound reflections. Um, and ultimately what it's come down to is the fact that you do want to hear some reflections. You don't want strong specular reflections. Um, you do want to absorb a bit. You don't want to absorb too much. So let me go forward and give you that recipe. Yeah, so for it, yeah. first of all, overall, without looking at where the, the materials are, you really, you know, in a given room, whether it's 15 feet long or 20 feet long or 30 feet long, long which is typically the sizes of the rooms the listenership is working with here, between 15 and 30 feet long, you want to treat the side walls and the ceiling and the back wall with about 15 percent absorptive surface no more than that and you so want them 10. evenly not more than 15 to 20 percent any more than that the room will have too little reflected energy and it's going to sound wrong you then also want to put some scattering uh devices you're sometimes calling them reflectors uh, but really they should be called either scattering or diffuser uh, surfaces these are materials that uh, take the sound in them and break them into small pieces. And you generally want to interleave them with the absorption all the way around the room uh, with hemi-disc diffusion towards the front and hemisphere towards the back. And what that does is improves the spaci spaciousness of the room and fools you into believing that you're in a bigger room than you really are. Gotcha. So this is what it's going to look like. So I'm going back to that same diagram with that rhyme or reason. But let me actually show you now the walls as independent ele elevation. So this is the left wall. This is your customer sitting here in, in his or her chair. Uh, this is the left wall. There's a speaker behind an acoustically transparent screen, which is the best way to do it. And on the side walls, you're going to put a little bit of absorption, not that much, 15%. Um, and then we're going to put some diffusion. Let me show you. If you took that same room, you took those three panels and stuck them on the floor, that's all there's going to be, less than 25% of the room. If you do more than that, the room's going to be too dead. And then you're going to lay them out evenly in the room so that there isn't a preference of where the reflections are. There's a really bad theory from the 70s that said all the absorption goes at the front and all the diffusion goes at the back. That's been debunked. You should never do that. That was called LED. Do not do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's much better to have an even distribution of energy all the way around you. A lot of work has been done by a lot of researchers that have gotten doctorates in this. This is what works. So. A bit of absorption scattered around the room. Some scattering devices interleave with the absorption uh, towards the front of the room, scattering devices that keep all the energy horizontally, and towards the back of the room, scattering devices that spread the energy in three dimensions. I call That's why I call those 3D diffusers. That's our left wall. Here's our front speakers, our left, center, or right. Here's our side speakers. Um, 
this would be the right wall, same thing, uh, absorbers interleaved with diffusion. You may notice that they're asymmetrical, where there is a diffuser on one side, there's an absorber on the other side, and that's because oh, it's just flipped. I got, yeah, yeah. better for the reflections to have a low correlation in their character back to your auditory system than if they're identical. If the reflections, if the pattern of reflections from the walls are the same on the left and right side, they are misinterpreted as mono sound because oh. your brain hears it as the same sound, even though it's coming from the walls, and it monos up the sound field. It reduces it like the canceling it out or something. Is that what's going on? It's not canceling it out. The, the net ref, the net reflection energy from the left wall and the right wall should be different for your brain to go, oh yeah, those are reflections. Gotcha. If they're the same, they could end up sounding like it's two speakers widely spaced generating sound at the same time and interpret it as a phantom center. Don't do it. It's like, it's, it's almost perfectly imperfect, you know? Perfectly imperfect, exactly. Yeah. And again, a lot of work has been done by, by, by researchers in this stuff. I got the resources at the end here that show all of the, the, the uh, uh, websites you can go to to read about this. All right. Yeah, cool, 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 cool. This is a good thing to do is to absorb the middle of the back wall so that there's no, no direct slap return to, your, to the back of your head and put some scattering devices on the outer part of the back wall. These would be your back speakers. I call them back, not rear speakers, but back wall, so that when you actually have um, the labels on your speaker cables, that's called BL and BR, not RL and RR, where it could be confusing. All right, and then the, uh, the front wall, well, I lost it. Okay, so the result of all this, again, is some even spaciousness um, that gives you this, this really smooth dis distribution of sound energy throughout the room, okay? So, awesome. um, there are a whole bunch of different ways to put panels on the walls to get there. Uh, we have a, a line now called Sonatus, where there's a, a, a basic solution, a premium solution, and an advanced solution. I'm going to pause on the premium solution over here. These are actual renderings that show the same thing I just showed. This is an, a pair of absorber panels, two foot by two foot, stacked on top of each other. That's a hemi disc diffuser. These slots this way, when the sound from the speakers hit them, they scatter in a really even horizontal plane an absorber, and then a 3D diffuser, hemisphere, uh, sound that hits that, that passes your head, goes over here, gives you a nice fill-in from the back of the, of the room. Um, so that supports the surround speakers and supports the enveloping energy from the front speakers. Um, so this is the ultra version of that, which switches from synthetic materials to wood. It's really pretty. Okay, um, so there's another way to look at this. This is a different system called Sonata. Uh, again, uh, this would be a 300, 350 square foot room, absorbers, diffusers, absorbers, diffusers, and all this stuff. So at this point in time, some of you guys are going to go, whoa, that's a lot of stuff to put on the walls. You know, my partner's going to hate me for doing this. I'm going to have to yeah. you know, get a divorce or something. Yeah. Well, the way it's done in upscale theaters is you stick all this ugly crap on the walls and you hide it with stretch fabric. So this is a room we've done. Uh, and all of the CD award-winning rooms that you see out there, we've won a lot of them, a lot of other designers, a lot of integrators have won those. The majority of them look like this because what's actually on the wall is stretch fabric that's concealing this stuff. So here's some subwoofers, some surround speakers, some scattering diffusers, some absorbers, all of this stuff. That's Anthony, the trick. If you put the stretch fabric over the speaker, I would assume yeah. that that would make a little bit of a difference in your measurements. So you probably have to, just like video, you do the calibration once everything is set in place. Uh, y yes and no. If you pick the stretch fabric as being essentially like grilled cloth, and there's a number of vendors of fabric that have very acoustically transparent material, it's not going to change very much up until you get to eight or nine kilohertz, and you certainly want to tune that. But right. yes, yes, you need to do all of the calibration after the fabric's up. Do not put fabric that occludes the sound. It needs to be acoustically open like grilled cloth. And like I said, there's a lot of really good stuff out there that looks yeah. very interesting that we've done tons and tons of tests on. There's probably, I don't know, two or 300 different fabrics that are appropriate for this application. That's cool, man. Well, I've got uh, this stuff. Let me fast forward into something else. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, I could sit here and talk to you for hours. We, we should maybe think about doing a, maybe a follow-up, maybe next week or something. Yeah, let's do that. That sounds that fun. Cool. We, go, we can go a little deeper, you know. Um, so here's a room we did actually at a, at a, tr a, a showroom for a, a dealer in California. Um, and I did want to point out that if you design the room correctly and you use the right materials, this doesn't suck. You know, this is okay. It's a 
it's this was actually a Munsell gray, uh, some black fabrics, some wood diffusers. Um, yeah, it's not for everybody, but for certain design styles that can look okay, right? So uh, this is a studio, this is a listening room, a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, um, there was a question that came in, and uh, you know, this is this is all you. I, I wouldn't know how to answer this. Uh, he says, "What is the URL uh, to uh, research on the IACC theory behind non-symmetrical acoustic treatments, or the non-symmetrical acoustical treatment method?" Is that um, IACC? Does that the interoral cross correlation? I oh, okay, cool. Uh oh, my computer is not liking this right now. It uh -oh. says, <laughs> okay, um, oh, so uh, there is some stuff. Wow. Um, all right. So if whoever asked that, uh, take a snapshot of this. There are some references in the work by by Angus. There's some references in the work by Cutruff, and I'm going to go to the next page here. There's some references by Schroeder, and there is a Greek researcher. I just I just happened on his doctoral work that I don't have in here, uh, but maybe if whoever's asking can shoot you a quick email and I can yeah totally that, that would be great. Perfect. Uh, really yeah, we can get that stuff. I will mention this anecdote. I didn't used to know this uh, about 15 years ago. Up until 15 years ago or 16 years ago, all the rooms I designed were symmetrical because that was, you know, the, the thing. And one day by mistake, a, uh, a builder uh, made a mistake in what was the front and back and put the panels asymmetrically on the room. It's like, well, okay, so the room sounds good, but it's asymmetrical, so can you please change all this? We'll come back after lunch and continue the calibration and listening test. So the room was now turned from asymmetrical to symmetrical and suddenly the imaging went to hell uh, the, the spaciousness was lost. It was like, whoa, what happened? So sheepishly, I asked the installer to change everything back. He looked at me with uh, some uh, annoyance, <laughs> and he was, it was better. It was like, yeah. what was this all about? So that led me actually at the time to the UC Berkeley Library to go look through a bunch of research, or research done, and I found some references. And so it is real, um, and basically comes from the fact that what you want in correlation is the left and right speakers, the center speaker, you want all of that to be clear and correlated. Um, and all of the reflections, you really want to be scattered with low IACC, interoral cross correlation. Um, he did just chime back in and he said he actually was talking about the, the Greek guy. So he's going to, uh, he'll email me and we'll get that information to him. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Nagliotu, if I remember, was the guy's name. So uh, now you're asking my poor memory to work. So <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Enough about okay. that. Uh, if I can abuse of two more seconds of yeah, time. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I had a couple of people comment and they're like, we're, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> I can be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're not allowed to go out. You're stuck with us. Yeah. Um, so oh, this is really interesting. Let me see if I have anything else open that's chewing up resources here. Um, so can you guys still see my screen? Yeah, but now your battery's uh, screaming at you. There you go. All right. Well, so guys, I guess my battery's tired of all this. So we're gonna oh, stop. that's okay. That's okay. Let's see um, let, me, let me go back. Up. Let me go back up over here. Give me a quick second. Uh, what I wanted to show you. Um, so on the first session, we had talked about immersive audio. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, anybody interested um, in talking about that real quick? Anybody want to sure. have a quick I'm chat, John? Fine. I mean, I mean, you know, you hear the word Atmos all the time. In, yeah, DTSX, in Atmos, object-based stuff, yeah. And we got some yeses from the question box, too. We may have just lost Anthony, actually. If his battery was that low, uh, we yep. may have just totally lost him. Yeah, I think we did. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I'll have him uh, send me um, what he was about to show us. And then if you guys are interested, um, I can send that out to you. And uh, Or maybe we can just pick back up. Uh, I, I think, John, uh, this is such a conversation that could go for so long if we wanted to. So uh, maybe we should just get with Anthony uh, maybe next week or something and do a follow-up to this call. Um, I'm pretty much done, guys. I don't really have much more for you. I did want to show you just real quick um, some of the things that we saw. Um, yeah, Josh, I, I agree with you. Uh, do another session. Yeah, totally, totally agree with you. Um, so I did have, just have like two, two more slides. And let me... 
pop over here real quick and I'll show you guys my screen. And boom. So, uh, okay, good. We talked a lot about the audio. That's great. That's all out of the out of the way now. Um, what I wanted to show you guys last, uh, I mentioned this before. Uh, if you're using some of the AV Pro product, especially the matrix switches, and you want control over those, uh, we do work with all the major control manufacturers. In fact, we just partnered up with a new one called Josh AI that's going to allow us to do voice commands uh, with uh, with the AV Pro stuff. So I'm super excited about that. If you guys have any specific um, automation companies you might work with that aren't listed here on the on the um, on the screen. These are just the majors. Uh, let us know. We make our API available. So if you do have a automation company in mind that's not listed here, uh, we can certainly do some work on our end to uh, to work with those guys. So you just let us know. Uh, the last thing I wanted to to talk about uh, is really just the future and what we're seeing. Uh, I've been seeing some really interesting things in these in the trade shows in the past couple of years. We're now dealing with micro LED. You know, I, I don't know, uh, John, how you might feel about this, but I, I think the potential with micro LED uh, is huge and enormous and, uh, you know, physically enormous, uh, but also yeah. the implications of uh, what this might do to the projector business is also very curious to me as well. Yeah, um, especially, especially, I mean, you know, I, I think the smallest micro LED uh, panel you can get these days is 75 inch. I don't think they can make it any smaller than that. That's so, the smallest I've seen as well. Yeah, so it, it's designed to be big, right? And you know, with an 8K resolution, you don't have to worry about uh, you know uh, the content uh, becoming pixelated or, exactly. or getting a lot of artifacts and things to that effect. Uh, you know, I, I'm excited about HDMI 2.1 in terms of the future. I mean, it it holds things other than just the idea of having more pixels. It is how it, you know, right now in, in the 4K space, we have things like high dynamic range, HDR, mm -hmm. so you've got, you know, Dolby Vision, HDR10, et cetera, et cetera. Those, 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 those technologies are, are great. I mean, especially that dynamic lighting controls uh, where different portions of the screen can be lightened or darkened and so forth. Uh, well, take that and with, with HDMI 2.1 and 8K, that you put that on steroids, it gets even yeah. more uh, realistic, if you will, more we, natural looking. We did a webinar, I don't know if you remember, with Florian Friedrich, who does a lot of work in the 8K space right now. He did like some NASA ISS videos in 8K, and he's really one of the one of the lead guys when it comes to that. And we did a whole webinar with him uh, a few months back, and he was he was describing about how because you have so many more pixels to work with, the scaling is a lot better. So instead of trying to guess two or three pixels, uh, I'm sorry, instead of trying to guess eight or 10 pixels around you, uh, you only have to guess two or three pixels around you. So he was saying how the upscaling, uh, and, uh, and also too with the introduction of AI upscaling to all this too, um, you know, 8K is not just more pixels, it's more pixels that are also a lot smarter too. So even watching like 1080p stuff or 4K stuff on the 8K screen should look awesome. Uh, I've only seen 8K uh, with my own eyes in controlled environments and with some test patterns. So I haven't even really seen a good, uh, uh, you know, a good real world example yet, but I'm excited to. I think, um, you know, we've got the uh, the Olympics, which unfortunately are now postponed. Uh, they're talking about high res and high frame rate. Um, there's a, a broadcaster in the UK that's talking about high frame rate and high res for, for soccer or football. Uh, we saw the Super Bowl uh, in 4K HDR this last Super Bowl. It looked amazing. So yeah, lots of great stuff coming with 2.1. I'm excited to see some of these giant uh, OLED panels that we're seeing uh, coming out of the OLED manufacturing right now, where we can do, or they can do the the main piece of glass, the mother glass, if you will. Uh, and, you know, we might be seeing some 100, 120 inch OLEDs here pretty soon, which I think is cool. Uh, so those are getting bigger. The resolution is getting higher. The bandwidth requirements are getting more and more and more. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, but we will uh, we will be here with you guys, and um, you know if you have any questions at all about maybe a room design or a, a system design, let me put some resources on the screen for you here. Feel free to reach out to us guys at any possible uh, time that you want to. AVProEdge, uh, Meridio.com, BulletTrainingCables.com, all three of those websites have the schedule for the rest of the training sessions uh, as we're all kind of locked down here. So feel free to check those out, register for as many as you want. Uh, if you have any questions specifically for us, you can always reach us at 605-274-6055. Uh, we also have live chat available on all of our websites. Uh, you can always in, uh, email info at avproedge.com. If you guys want to reach out to me directly, uh, feel free. It's jason at avproglobal.com. I love learning about new content. So if you guys have any uh, really great looking Blu-ray movies or anything like that, I, I totally nerd out with those types of things. So feel free to uh, 
to send that stuff over to me. So uh, with that being said, thank you so much, John. Uh, we did have one more thank question you. from uh, from Bob that came through. Uh, my theater has Dolby Atmos speakers, but I cannot hear them. Why is that? Uh, Bob, let's let's talk about that offline. It could be a lot of things. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is is the content actually in Atmos. Uh, yeah, that's, that's going to be my first thing. You know, and I, I yeah. listened to reviews uh, on on uh, Atmos uh, content, like a, a movie. And, right. And, and certain certain movies out there have a much more active Atmos soundtrack than than others. Uh, yep. For example, the movie Braveheart has one of the most active Atmos soundtracks you could ever experience. Right. To the point where when the arrows are flying through the air, you almost want to duck before they hit. Yeah. You. So yeah. It's, that's cool. It's that good. It's that yeah. good. So, you know, Good. but but the, you know, others don't actually have hardly anything going on. Just like some some movies that have surround sound, you never hear the rear surround. Yeah, the rears are quiet for most of the movie. Yeah. Right. You know, what I'm hearing. Um, I need to go pick it up because I've heard nothing but great things so far. But apparently, the Atmos soundtrack in that movie, 1917, is supposed to be killer. So that, okay. that's going to be a good disc to pick up here pretty soon. Yes. So, Anthony is back. Uh, thank you so much, John. Uh, again, guys, we're going to put this recording up uh, in. Um, uh, tonight or tomorrow up on YouTube. So if you want to go back and rewatch, feel free. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions for us specifically. And uh, thank you guys so much for attending the webinar and we will see you on the next one. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for your time.